Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, happy Thursday uh, to you and yours. Uh, the weekend is just around the corner. I'm back in Nashville. It's always good to be home uh, here in Nashville, here in Music City. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, show planned for you today. Uh, St Steve Kim is going to be here. Uh, we're going to talk a little sports. We're going to talk a little Jay Williams and Kyrie Irving, a uh, little rap, hip hop, uh, some OBJ perhaps to the Dallas Cowboys, and uh, Jeff Saturday, uh, the new coach of the Colts, had some interesting comments or kind of a Rob Ross speech defending himself at his, uh, one of his press conferences here this week, and we'll react to that. We'll do an approval rating on Jeff Saturday. And uh, we'll have some Tennessee Harmony uh, with Pastor Anthony and TJ Moe uh, will join us for the uh, Tennessee Harmony conversation where we'll talk about fear and, and how we can't be allow fear to control us and how fear has taken over this country because we've walked away from God uh, so fantastic show uh, planned for you today. Uh, well, we'll Steve Kim's just around the corner, but first I want to tell you guys about uh, Crowd Health. Putting your life on autopilot is a guaranteed way to dis to disappointment. If you carelessly buy a new house, marry just anybody, or make any other big life decision before taking care of yourself, what are you doing? Let's be honest. The insurance model is broken thanks to Crowd Health. We can do something about it. Crowd Health puts your health care back in your hands. Cut out the middleman, save money, fund your health care costs without relying on big government or big insurance companies. Only pay the first $500 of any health care event. The Crowd Health community takes care of the rest. No exclusive doctor networks, no huge premiums or high deductibles, no surprises. Crowd Health beats insurance by totally reversing the vicious incentives that got us into this mess in the first place. So take charge of your health care today with Crowd Health. Open enrollment is the only time you can hit eject on the broken system without penalty. So don't wait. And for a limited time, join for just $99 per month for just the first six months when you use the promo code FEARLESS at, crowd, at joincrowdhealth.com. That's join crowdhealth.com promo code fearless crowd health is not health insurance it's a totally different way of paying for health care terms and conditions may apply all right uh, let's roll out to uh, Los Angeles bring in our main man Steve Kim Steve I want to start here uh, Jay Williams uh, we got to throw him some flowers I think uh, you know shockingly he stepped out here on a limb over his social media put together a little video, maybe five, six minutes, of him talking about uh, Kyrie Irving. We're gonna play a little excerpt here uh, of him talking about Kyrie Irving, and then I wanna ask you, are you surprised Jay Williams is showing this kind of support uh, for Kyrie Irving? Let's play the clip. So when I hear what Kyrie Irving has to go through in order to be reinstated, I'm appalled. I'm appalled. And let me give you examples of how I feel like we don't have the same energy and hold other people who have dealt with racial tropes accountable. So when Sarah Silverman does blackface or when Don Imus says nappy headed hoes or when Howard Stern calls somebody the N word in the skit or when Brett Favre takes money from the state of Mississippi, we don't ask them to get sensitivity training we don't ask them to donate $500,000. We don't ask them to meet with the Black National Caucus. They apologize. And then, you know what? The rest of the world moves on. But what I feel like is happening here, and that's how in the Black community, like we've been told that's how the process works, right? Think about that, Bert. That's how the process works. Oh, somebody does a blackface. Oh, it was a misunderstanding. We got it. Okay. You know, is that person really racist? Probably not. Was it ignorant? Probably so. Okay. We understand it. We move forward. We don't like it. We would love to hold them accountable. But society and having a lot of black people in positions of power, we don't have the governability to do that. But what we feel like happens with Kyrie is even after an apology, it's not enough. We feel like there needs to be more. 
And a lot of people I've spoken to over the last couple of days talk about this thing, older mentors of mine talk about buck breaking. It's so we talk about tropes. This is something that we feel like in the black community that happened way back in the day where if there was a slave that was defiant, right? He got broken in front of everybody in order to show that he was not in a position of power. And that at the end of the day, he had to do what he was told to do because that's what was mandated of him. And there's a bigger situation going on. What's happening with Kyrie Irving? If the Nets don't want him to be there, just say you don't want him to be there. But we should hold everybody accountable, even owners of teams accountable with things that are happening in other countries, i.e. China and Wiggers. Ooh. Steve, uh, your thoughts, uh, uh, Jay Williams seemed to be letting them hang uh, out here. I, I wonder, will he get in trouble at ESPN for this? First of all, slow 80s clap. Slow 80s, I just want to get get that right off the bat. And that, I mean, a couple things. Jay, you obviously don't want to work at ESPN. And my message is to Glenn Beck of this fine network, Glenn, send him an offer. <laughs> Because obviously he must not value his position at the four-letter network. He must be sick and tired of Bristol. I don't blame him. Famous quote from a a guy that worked there long ago, Sal Marciano, happiness is Bristol in your rearview mirror. Got fired for saying that on the air, by the way. I get the sense Jay Williams is saying, you know what? It's time to tell the truth. But to your question, am I surprised? that Williams took this stance. No, it's actually been very consistent as it relates to Kyrie Irving. Let's go back about, what, 8 to 12 months ago when it came to the vaccine subject. He was staunchly defending Kyrie Irving's ability to make his own choice. So this is actually very consistent to what he's thought. And he never, I'll be honest with you, Jay Williams went to Duke, has always been educated. And I, this is, I'm going to go deep a little bit. Because of the way his career played out, when he tried to be evil Knievel and it ruined his career early on, he got separated from that athletic world and he had to kind of go out into the real world and he has a different perspective than guys who just solely made their money or had their place in society from dribbling, shooting, and catching a ball. So his worldview is probably a little bit more evolved than most ex-athletes. And with all of that combined, no, I I am actually not surprised. I am surprised, though, that he hasn't taken that down yet or he hasn't issued an apology. But again, to Jay Williams, uh, my, my tip of the cap, I think that was a very brave, courageous stance in an era when you simply are not allowed to be honest. I think that I don't agree with everything he said there. I think some of his analogies were wrong but I do think he represents a frustration that I think is pervasive throughout ESPN. People haven't been able to put their fingers on it. People are afraid of what it says about them, that they're that kind of frustrated. But this matriarchal, feminized, leftist culture just doesn't fit an alpha male athlete comfortably. And, and, and these guys are, people over at ESPN, men in general, and particularly athletes, they're trapped in a box where it's like, oh, I got to say what's popular on social media. I got to say what I, I think makes me sound black. And everybody has told me, the system has told me that in order to sound black, I got to sound like a woman, basically. And, and I can't. You know, you got to tell so many different lies, so many things that you really don't believe. And you will never convince me that anybody over at ESPN that has a pair waving, wagging between their legs believes that Kyrie Irving has done anything that should get him suspended or that he should even have to apologize for. Well, Jason, hold on. Let's go back to last week. Jalen Rose, ironically, gave what I believe is on the Mount Rushmore of forced apologies. Did you see that? I mean, it looked like there was a <laughs> gun to his it. head. And I'm like, Jalen, um, Chris Webber had his timeout moment. 
That was your timeout moment. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and look, you the, the whole thing with Ima Doka, like, you know, should the woman be named, whatever, I, I kind of get it because of the corporate structure and the whole Me Too generation that we're in. You can argue his point, but literally Jalen Rose was forced to go back on what he truly believed, and that is, see, you, you say it's the popular message? No, 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 Jason. It's the approved messaging of the corporation. Let me give you a small example in my short stint at the Four Letter Network. I am not a fan of women's boxing. I tolerate it. I like some of the fighters. I enjoy some of it. Most of it, I don't like. But when I was there as the boxing reporter, there was this feeling that, Steve, you have to not only push women's boxing and write about it when you don't want to, you have to really like it. And I'm thinking, I, I really don't like it. I, I think it's an inferior product right now. It's still evolving. It's still got a long ways to go. And I still remember certain social media posts that I put up that weren't just like, hey, hate Whitey, we love BLM, power to the people. Oh, trust me, that had to come down real fast. So, yeah, I mean, look, Jay Williams, I want to see if that actually stays up on his social media. And number two, let's see in a day or two if he is being forced to take back some of those words. That, to me, is the most interesting aspect of this whole subject. I think it's been up 24, 48 hours at this point. Okay. I don't think All it's right. coming down. And, and I think, uh, again, trust me, Jalen Rose, that was a forced apology. He, I think the reason why they forced him to make the apology is because he forced the whole Udoka comment into the conversation when it wasn't necessary when it, the naming of the executive and all that other stuff th that was that was <laughs> Jalen no no so that was Jalen showing his frustration again these they don't Jalen Rose I don't want to say they I don't want to speak in too big of generalities but but because ESPN has run off all the intellectual seasoned masculine energy Jalen is just floundering around frustrated. He can't really figure out exactly what he's frustrated about and what about the Udoka situation really frustrates him. And so, you know, picking on uh, the woman not being named, he thinks is brave. And, and, and again, that's because he and other athletes, they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand the system. And, and ESPN is bent over back. But they're justifiably frustrated that their instincts, their values have no place in the world that ESPN has created. And so you're going to start seeing more of this, what Jalen Rose did and the quick, the quick backpedal. Uh, you're going to see more people posting social media stuff with their real thoughts because Jay Williams is doing that over Twitter and over through his cell phone as a way of saying, I can't really say this at ESPN. I got to go to my own social media feed to tell you what I really think. And I just think that's pervasive throughout ESPN. Everybody yeah. over there is frustrated with this diversity, Jason. equity, and inclusion censorship stuff that's going on. You know, about a month ago, Jason Brown mentioned that there's this ESPN personality whose role has been diminished or severely cut back, Bart Scott. And I was like, huh? I've noticed, I don't see a lot of Bart Scott. Not that I watch ESPN anymore, but even on the clips, I, he, he's never featured on anything. And he said that's because he's too much of a masculine guy that tells the truth and he doesn't toe the political and social line. What happened to Bart Scott? To see him again? Can't wait, as he once said. But yeah, I let's see. But Jay Will's different though. He's a main cog in that show with Keyshawn Johnson and Max Kellerman. Um, and I find that show to be interesting, believe it or not. I disagree with a lot of stuff that is said, but when I'm in my car early morning, I'll actually flip it there. They hold my attention because they do have divergent opinions. Like Keyshawn Johnson is interesting. I disagree with a lot of what he says, but you know what? I enjoy him. I do. He actually says things that infuriate me and they're laughable, but he is entertaining and he stands on his ground for the most part. Uh, Jay Will... Uh, he's gone up in my estimation going back to last year because he's the one NBA guy that really strongly said, wait a minute, hold on. Why should anybody be forced into capitulate to the vaccine? Because it was very easy to take the anti-Kyrie Irving stance as it related to the vaccine. 
just him doing that, he already put himself out there. Now with this, again, let's monitor this. What will be his role moving forward at the Four Letter Network? Steve, I'm going to say something that uh, the audience, some of the audience will be like, oh, Whitlock's just being self-serving, self-aggrandizing, patting himself on the back. But but it's just, I'm just, I'm sorry, it's just factual. (laughs) When ESPN ran me out of there, that was them sending out a bat signal. Men with balls aren't welcome. We don't want any real men. We want feminized men. And so our intel, because I was the intellectual backbone for masculine men at ESPN. That's what I represented. They run me off and, and they say, no guys, you, you see Bomani Jones, Howard Bryant, these feminized men, that's our blueprint. That's our, the, the kind of masculine energy we want come from these guys that are highly feminized and have a matriarchal point of view and are basically Yas queens themselves. And, and what, what Jalen Rose doesn't understand, Jay Williams doesn't, you know, and I'm not beating up these guys, but with all these, Kendrick Perkins, with all these guys, they can't be themselves without someone like me that's able to argue down and stand toe to toe with all these Ivy League educated executives they got and all the other little, uh, all the feminists they got running around there. I'm not scared of none of them because the truth's on my side and I know how to articulate it. These athletes don't. They need to be backed up by someone with a pair and what they're finding out is like, Stephen A. Smith's pair ain't big enough. He, he's not smart enough to stand toe to toe with these guys. He can occasionally uh, put a Malika Andrews, a child in her place, but for the long haul, for the real fight with the executives and all the, the feminists running wild and the, the, the feminized male executives they got running around there, they're not smart enough. Dave Roberts, who's the executive backing uh, Stephen A. Smith, he's not smart enough. And, and, and I'm not trying to pick on any of these guys. I'm just telling you the facts. And, and so they don't have anybody on the inside that can back them up intellectually and, and explain uh, these situations to them and for them on the air that would give them the room to be real men. And so now, you know, Jay Williams understands that. He went to Duke. He's actually a pretty smart guy. And that's why he's taking the social media. And maybe just what you're saying, he's uh, ready to get out of ESPN, is ready to draw a line in the sand with him. And I, I think eventually it may take some time, but the rest of them are going to grow up here too and, and say, you know, this check is good. Uh, but Lord have mercy, I can't wear this skirt comfortably. Uh, well, I'm going to leave that to Bomani and Howard Bryant. Jason, a couple of things. I remember when I, uh, the last year that ESPN, when I would mention that I really enjoyed Speak for Yourself to ESPN employees or my some of my super, the looks that I would get, they were horrified. And then during the last, I, I enjoyed retweeting all of your stuff and all your clips because I knew it, it, it upset them. But for some reason, they would actually, they would like, all right, we got to give Kim this. Let him retweet that stuff. Here's the interesting thing. Uh, Jay Will did in a much more, I would say, intellectual fashion of making uh, uh, an escape from ESPN than Paul Pierce. Remember Paul Pierce last year? He just flat out in the middle of a poker game had ladies of the night and exotic dancers getting buck wild. He's living his best life, and he just said, okay, ESPN. What's that old line from that country song? Take this job and shove it. And you know what? Paul Pierce seems pretty happy right now. I think he's living a really good life, and he seems very satisfied with his decision. Uh, Steve, I can only make this reference because of your knowledge of hip-hop. Uh, I, I, I ran into this, uh, Barrington Martin, I think over Twitter is a guy yeah. I follow, <laughs> very smart guy. He yeah. tweeted out something about this whole Kyrie controversy. He tweeted out about, uh, uh, KRS one who was mm. for many years, probably the first 15 years of my love affair with rap music. He was my all time favorite rapper, uh, and, and, and Karis One used to do all these highly political, militant, educational rap songs. And Barrington reminded me of the song. 
that KRS One put out years ago, and I believe in 1989, I was a senior in college, and I remember the first time I heard it. It's called Why Is That? And it, it was, it's cut from the exact same cloth as what Kyrie Irving's talking about now. And, and I'm like, how did we go from Boogie Down Productions and KRS-One being one of the most popular <laughs> rap groups, making songs, saying all the same things that Kyrie Irving seems to stand for, Hebrew Israelites seem to stand for, that was all perfectly fine just 30 years ago. And now it's like, oh my God, we can't platform these people. And so it reminded me of the song. Why I, I just want to read, we can't play the song, but somebody go look it up. And, and, and Karis One's preaching the exact same stuff that Kyrie's talking about. Genesis chapter 11, verse 10, explains the genealogy of Shem. Shem was a black man in Africa. If you repeat this fact, they can't laugh at you. Genesis 14, verse 13, Abraham steps on the scene. Being a descendant of Shem, which is a fact, means Abraham too was black. Abraham born into the city of a black man called Nimrod, grandson, grandson of Cam. Cam had four sons, one was named Canaan, here, let me do some explaining. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons for real, and these were the children of Israel. I'm gonna just stop there. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop there, because that goes back, that connects all the dots. So like, what Kyrie's talking about, what these Hebrew Israelites are talking about, none of it's brand new. This has been out there. We didn't used to be afraid of it. We, people that disagreed, listened to the music or heard the conversation and responded to it. I, I just can't understand how Kyrie has become public enemy number one. When you've lived as long as I have, when you, there, none of this is new. Uh, and, and I just don't understand how we've come, and it's social media, I guess, that has come to this point where KRS One, in any of the, all these people, they all have to be censored now and, and shut down. Well, but uh, you know, you being a rap fan, do you remember KRS One? Knowledge yes, reigns supreme I mean, he, over he nearly everyone. Yeah, he is the scholar and the conscience of hip hop. And but I, he came from an era though, and this is what people do not understand. If you're not our age, many of those rappers from that first generation and what I call it the MTV Yo MTV Raps generation of hip hop many of those guys actually went to college they had degrees people do not realize that Flavor Flav believe it or not actually went to college uh, one of the both guys I think I Ron know. or DMC actually went to St. John's Pop, uh, Chuck D went to college many of these guys were educated but the groups back then that were like Poor Righteous Teachers X Clan KRS One Brand Nubian they would not get radio play they would get no corporate uh, support in this day and age. I don't know what happened. Uh, KRS One was very learned. I don't know if he went to college, but he's certainly very, very educated. And he would speak on things. He used to call what he did edutainment. He used to take pride in the fact I'm going to educate you in an entertaining way. And, and his his music had a lot of. It, it's interesting. He had a large like spectrum. Some of the songs were like criminal minded and other ones were really learned, like you're going into a textbook about African-American history. Um, so but that is no longer allowed. I, I, I try to listen to some of the modern day hip hop. It is the de-evolution of an art form. It truly is. And it's, it's not the same music and just the way they look, the way they dress nowadays. I think it's very strange to, to what it was. And I'm not saying that fashion has not changed from the mid 80s all the way to 2022, but it's it's a totally different genre. At one point, rap music had a conscience. In fact, it was supposed to. And me and Delano have brought this up. When there was massive gang violence and drive-by shootings became a part of the American lexicon and inner city violence, there were two sets of rappers. There's the West Coast All Stars who did. We're all in the same gang. So guys like Easy E, Ice Cube, um, Ice T would come together, and they did a public service announcement, basically saying, "Let's stop shooting each other." And then the more famous song was led by KRS One, "Self Destruction," which is a very, very good song. It had Cool Mo D in it. I think LL Cool J, uh, Stetson. MC Light. Or MC Light. Now, if any rapper had any song 
that that delved into that and said, wait a minute, let's stop doing this to ourselves. You know what they would be called? Coon, sellout. Oh, my God, they must listen to Whitlock, you know, stuff of that nature. The last conscious hip hop song that I really liked is from Nas, his most underrated song. It's not among his most popular, but but the alliteration and the way he's able to put it together is a song called I Gave You Power. Basically gives his life as a gun. He actually describes himself as what he's built for, how he was made, and what he's used for. And it's a powerful song. Never got any radio play. You had to literally buy that album and listen to it five times before you realize, wow, this is pretty deep. How the, how the song ends with him being shot off, killing another black man. And it's like, wow. Like it, but it would never play. It would not get any type of studio play. It wouldn't be played in the clubs. No one would play it before football games. It wouldn't happen. And one last thing about KRS-One, his most notable thing that he ever did, uh, outside his great career album, <laughs> remember when he bum-rushed PM Don? That was one of the funniest things. So PM Don, those hippie rappers, were, and they had said some stuff about hip-hop culture that he thought was disrespectful. And so KRS-One and his crew saw PM Don at a concert. They just bum-rushed the stage. They just threw him out of there. You don't remember that? That was funny to him. No one was hurt. No one was shot. I vaguely remember says, he just says, no, 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 you are not disrespecting hip-hop. Get out of here, you hippies. So anyway, that's my memory of him. <laughs> All right. I, I just want, you were somebody I could walk down memory lane about KRS-One. You know what? I may have to put KRS-One up here on my uh, music <laughs> little uh, collage or, or, or whatever. Maybe I should bring Chuck D. To, Chuck D's gone so woke. Uh, yeah, that I, may, I know. May have to bring I public know. enemy it's down. Sad. I, yeah, I was, <laughs> <sighs> yeah, it's, it ain't good. It ain't good. All right, uh, I want to move on to uh, the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, all seem to think that OBJ, Odell Beckham Jr., who's about to come back from this knee injury and about to sell himself, auction himself off to a team. You got Micah Parsons out there tweeting, man, OBJ, talk to me. OBJ, let's do this. S-H-I-T. <laughs> uh, the, the Cowboys mm. are begging it seems the players are begging for OBJ to come to Dallas. Uh, do you think he would be the perfect addition and make the Cowboys a Super Bowl contender? I'd ask Odell one question. That role you played behind Cooper Cup as a really dynamic and useful number two receiver, if you're willing to do that for C.D. Lamb, I would strongly consider it. I think his days as a true number one receiver are over. But, um, again, me and you disagree on this. I thought the last month and a half he was really effective. And the Rams won a Super Bowl because of his contributions. If he's willing to capitulate and say, you know what, there are games I'm not going to get thrown to ten times, but every once in a while I could really help. And if Michael Gallup's knee, if he has not fully recovered, and as long as he understands that, hey, now I am a really well-known role player, yes, I would actually consider it. If not... I would move off him. That simple. Yeah, I, I think he would be a good addition. I think that that would put a lot of pressure on Dak Prescott because if, if they add yeah. OBJ and, and Dak Prescott's performance and the offense's performance doesn't elevate because that defense is loaded and is good and the front seven – uh, can get to the quarterback, and they can defend on the back end. Defense is Super Bowl ready. Having just watched Matt Stafford and the Rams yeah. add OBJ and, and run to the Super Bowl, again, this would put a lot of pressure on Dak Prescott because if he's not able to do the same thing with OBJ or if it mm. doesn't work out for some, some sort of reason, it's a bad look for Dak Prescott and all the money they paid Dak. Uh, but I, I, I get where the Cowboys are coming from, and I could see Jerry Jones wanting to make that move. It worked out last year for the Rams. It could work out again uh, this year for the Cowboys. Let's see. That OBJ to the Cowboys, that'd be a big deal. That would, that would add some spice to the NFL. Uh, there was a video you sent me, Steve, that I, I want to uh, talk about, and we'll do an approval rating on uh, Jeff Saturday, the new head coach of the Colts. Uh, so let's take a look here, Steve, at Jeff Saturday addressing the media and questions about his qualifications 
and then we'll unpack his approval rate. Mm. Mm. Ah. Uh, Steve, you sent me the video. I think you like this video. This is his way of, this is his version of Bobby Knight, who want, one of his famous quotes, hey, I've forgotten more about this game than you'll ever know. That's his way of telling a bunch of guys that never played the game of football, hey, look, I'm a football guy. Okay, I got this. I kind of know how to do this. I've been around it. But there's a famous clip of him as a player, which I think actually bodes well for him. I remember it was a Monday night game, and Peyton Manning was mic'd up. And Peyton Manning did a series of plays off some audibles, right? Omaha, Omaha, that Saturday said, well, wait a minute. Wait, why don't we run the ball a little bit? And him and Peyton got right into it. And you know what's funny? Saturday got right in Peyton's face and said, no, 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 I don't care who you are. We're the offensive line. You respect us. And it was great back and forth, and they laughed about it. In other words, he's not going to back down. And it's a great early message. Again, this could be a complete disaster, but I love that press conference performance. He won that press conference. I will give him that. All right, so we got to evaluate his job performance. And since yes. he hadn't coached the game, that press conference is all we have. So based on that press conference, I'm going to rate his job performance at a zero. Mm. This man has spent the last f three, four, five years as a broadcaster on TV. He gave a great broadcasting performance. That's what a broadcaster should do, a very seasoned broadcaster. He looked very comfortable talking to reporters, talking to the camera and all that. Great. None of that is coaching. And so I give him a zero in job performance at this point. I'm not sure if I buy his stick there. Again, maybe it's all true. And maybe he'll back it up in the coming days, weeks, in the eight weeks of this deal. But that just seemed like a broadcaster doing a good performance. He's a skilled broadcaster. He, he, he damn sure better have had a good, you know, rah-rah speech about why he's qualified. Uh, but I got to see it before I believe it. So zero in job performance. Okay, well, part my view is part of his job is to actually be the face of the franchise, right? Well, that was a really good performance. And right, is the has he won a game yet? No, but he hasn't coached either. But part of his job is to lead and shepherd this franchise to the end of the year, and they obviously have to make some major changes. On the field, and I think in the front office, I love the speech. I love the message he delivered. And for that, I, I think I'm probably being charitable given the fact his record is zero and zero. But I love that opening salvo. I gave him a 10. Mm. Uh, character. Uh, we'll move on to character. I I've heard no dirt on him, but also haven't heard a lot of great things about it. He's an offensive lineman center. You know, I, I remember I'm from Indianapolis. My family's all Colts fans. Uh, good guy. I got nothing negative to say about him, but I, I'm not going to go overboard too high on the character. We'll, we'll have to wait and see and let it play out. So I, I gave him a 17 in character. Okay. Offensive linemen are the heart and soul of a football team, or at least a good one. And to be a center, you are the glue of one of the most important units in all of sports. He did that unbelievably well at a high level. In fact, he might be a Hall of Fame caliber player if you think about it. Never had an issue, was a good soldier, thought that a good job on ESPN, walling off all that woke around him. I gave him a 20. I like the guy. He seems like a good, solid individual. I didn't have any problems with your comments, except maybe he's a Hall of Famer. No, he's not. He's a good football player. He's not a Hall of Famer. I mean, like 6'7 uh, Pro you know. Bowl. Okay, what a gee, good grief. He had, I didn't say he was Dwight it, Stevenson. You hike the ball Forgive to Peyton me. Manning, you're going to go to the Pro Bowl. You hike the ball to Peyton Manning, you're going to go to the Pro Bowl. It's, it's just that simple. Oh, it's just uh, that authenticity, easy. Okay, <laughs> authenticity. Authenticity. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm again, I don't know enough about him to, to knock his authenticity. Uh, this score I'm about to give is going to contradict what I said about his job performance to some degree, to the unsophisticated ear. But I'm going to go kind of high on his authenticity because, again, he's been a broadcaster. He did a good broadcasting performance. I kind of tend to think he believes what he just said in that press conference, whether it's true or not. Again, it's just like if anybody asks me, am I as good looking as Denzel Washington? I honestly believe that I am as good looking as, as Denzel Washington. Doesn't have anything to do with the truth, but I believe it. I'm like, well, Costanza, if you believe it, is it really a lie? 
No, it's not. And so I, I think he believes the stuff he was spewing. So I'll give him a 22 in authenticity. Yeah, and I believe I can karate chop like Bruce Lee. Okay, uh, look, I, I gave him a 25 <laughs> because he put himself out there. He could have been Captain Cliche and gone to coach speak and said, oh, geez, you know, I just want to – uh, I just want to be out there, and we just got to go game by game, and we got to play hard. And No, no, no. I love that. As a media member, when you're giving me that stuff, oh, I'm eating it up like Pac-Man. I love that. And he put a little bit of pressure on himself, but he showed some self-belief. I like that. I gave him a 25. Uh, it factor. You're, I'm just Your scores never make sense to me. Clearly, the guy's got some itch factor. He just did a nice little press conference. He's a broadcaster. Of course, he's got some itch. He's the first guy to ever just go from the broadcast booth to coaching a, a game without any coaching experience. He got some itch factor. Everybody knows the name. Everybody's going to be watching him today or this weekend. So I gave him a 15 in itch factor. How, how, how could you be this? Everybody's going to be watching this game to see how he does. And you got him at a five in itch factor, All right, Steve? hold on. Yeah, all right, man. Before you crown him as Vince Lombardi, let him win a game first. <laughs> this thing can go completely flat. What if this goes Magic Johnson after the second game? That's look. As much as I like Jeff Saturday, <laughs> Magic ain't gonna give that speech he just gave. <laughs> yeah, that ain't yeah, gonna I saw, never happen. I, yeah, I saw his monologues <laughs> on the Magic Hour. Trust me, I agree with you yeah. on that. But you know what? <laughs> Forget T.J. Mo. Call me Mizzou. You gotta show me. Let him win a game first. Let him hand out a game ball first to somebody. Hey, Sam Ellinger, game ball. You let us to win. Once he does that, again, these ratings are always fluid. He could go 6-2, and 7-2, and two, lead them to the playoffs. I'll give him a perfect score of 25 across the board. But, again, the it factor, now I'm judging him solely as a coach. And on-field performance matters to me. Uh, you gave him a five. All right, we both have him, though. We took different yeah. routes, yeah, but we see. both have him at Candlelit. I've got him at a 54. You got him at a 60. Uh, great job, Korean Cosell. Uh, we'll see you uh, tomorrow, perhaps. Uh, before we uh, move on to Tennessee Harmony, I got the perfect segue into Tennessee Harmony. I can just talk about my friends at Preborn. Uh, I want to share a testimony with you about a young mom who came into a preborn pregnancy clinic. A baby wasn't really in her plans, and even after seeing a halo on her baby's ultrasound, she was still leaning towards abortion. But then she heard the heartbeat, and she chose life. You see, <clears throat> when an expectant mother has an unplanned pregnancy, preborn is there. Preborn clinics introduce moms to their babies through ultrasound, and it's a divine encounter. Our goal at The Blaze this year is to rescue 50,000 babies. Will you help us? You can sponsor an ultrasound and introduce a mother to her unborn child for just $28. $140 helps rescue five babies' lives, <clears throat> and now through a match, your gift is doubled. To donate, dial pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, or donate securely at preborn.com slash Jason. That's preborn.com slash Jason. As of, as of the end of the year approaches, your tax write-off can save a life. These precious souls need our help. Please go to preborn.com slash Jason. All right, guys, stick around. Uh, go to youtube.com slash Jason Whitlock. Hit notifications to subscribe. Stick around. Tennessee Harmony, Pastor Anthony and TJ Moe. X. All right, welcome back. Uh, time for a little Tennessee Harmony. Uh, Pastor Anthony Walker in studio with me. Uh, let's bring uh, TJ Moe on screen, joining us from uh, Tennessee, I mean Tennessee, from the state of Missouri, from St. Louis. Uh, TJ, well, uh, well, TJ's been on Tennessee Harmony before. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. And if uh, Pastor Walker, if you could bless our conversation, then we'll get rolling. Father God, we are thankful for this day and thankful for your blessings. Father, bless us uh, to be bold in sharing the truth. Uh, bless us to be bold in uh, expressing our faith and living courageously in Christ. We're thankful for this platform in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. I, I want to add, this is a bit of a curveball because I'm just reacting to things that I'm seeing right now uh, over social media. LeBron James has put out a statement uh, over social media uh, telling the NBA, challenging the NBA on this suspension of Kyrie Irving. And, you know, I'm glad to do it. I'm a critic of LeBron's, but holy cow, I love this, that he did that, that these guys are starting to stand up. And it feeds right into our conversation we're about to have about fear. And the reason why I want to talk with uh, Pastor Anthony and TJ uh, about how I think fear is overtaking our society and it, 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 it's all uh, being powered by a rejection of God. When, when you uh, reject God and become a very secular society, uh, men and, the and then the whole world follows the lead of men, when they reject God, they become controlled by fear and, and anxiety. And we're afraid to do the right thing. And we're afraid of people that say things that we uh, make us uncomfortable, or we disagree with. And so my faith in God uh, empowers me not to be fearful. And so if, Ky if Kyrie Irving has some kind of uh, Hebrew Israelite religion beliefs that contradict my views, I'm not afraid of those views. I'm willing to deal with him and, and hear him out and explain the truth that I know, believe, and understand that comes from the Bible because I don't fear him. I don't fear dishonesty because I've got the light on my side and I'm looking at a society controlled by fear because of its rejection of God. Secular societies are controlled by fear Faith-based societies, Christian societies, Judeo-Christian culture, uh, faith-based societies aren't controlled by fear. And I just wanted to have that discussion and get more of a uh, biblical understanding from Anthony and TJ. So if Anthony, if you can react to any of that or all of that uh, to get us rolling, please do. Uh, you, you are right in your assessment that fear uh, is what's driving a lot of what we see in culture. You're also right in your assessment to say that biblically, fear is not the narrative. It is actually the opposite. It's courage. It's embracing truth. Um, scripture often teaches that we need to embrace, be willing to have the discussion, even between two people. Uh, Jesus brings up the scenario in the book of Matthew where he says, if you have an alt or if you have a grievance with your brother, uh, go talk to him. But in society now, we would rather deal, you know, behind the hand. We'd rather talk about him and talk to other people about rather to embrace that conversation. And the other thing with fear is we are so worried about what may happen and, and what the possibilities are that we would rather step two or three steps behind rather than to just, OK, let's just have this conversation. Let's just deal with it. And when you finally embrace the truth, will more things come out possibly? Or it could just be a dud as what you thought or, you know, what that really wasn't much of nothing anyway. And we move on to the next. But if we operate in fear, um, one thing I'll say before TJ jumps in, biblically, um, there are 365 ways that God tells us to fear not, you know. Interestingly enough, like 365 just with the days, it's either fear not, it's take courage, do not be afraid 365 times. And so if we read one of those passages a day, every day, the year would be filled with us not being afraid, with us taking courage, with us embracing uh, the truth. That's just the to set the table. TJ. <clears throat> I first learned what Panth uh, Pastor Anthony was talking about several years ago, and I think about it all the time, right? It's no mistake that God put it in the Bible 365 times. And, and that is the narrative of the Bible is that if you have God, you don't need fear. And, you know, to tie it into the LeBron James thing you're talking about, he's sitting at two and nine. Um, he's looking at his third losing season. 
in five years, right? LA is in the tank. You guys, you and Steve Kim have been talking about that all week here. Um, he's got nothing to lose, right? And that's actually where you see courage begin to sometimes appear. You get, you got nothing to lose. And so take a chance. Why not? This is why we see a lot with Jason, you and I talk about this off air a lot. A lot of these bloggers, right? They got nothing to lose. And so they have courage. They come out and make really good content. As soon as they get a bunch of money, suddenly they get conservative. They're not interesting anymore. And so God is our nothing to lose. He comes in and gives us, it's it's like, take Paul, for example, right? Paul's like, to live is Christ, to die is gain, right? In, in Philippians, he says uh, he, wanted, he had a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Like he's living his life and he's like, I'm just ready to go. Whenever God wants to take me, I'd like to go. Put me in jail, fine. I'll just save everybody who's there, right? It's a, there was nothing you can take from this man. He actually had nothing to lose, not only here on earth, but eternally. And so that is, that is the difference between Christians and the secular lifestyle. We're walking around with nothing to lose. Well, if you got nothing to lose, it's easy to have courage, right? That it doesn't take courage, in fact. When you've got nothing to lose, then you're not risking anything. And fear at its base, right? If you live a fearful life, you're a slave to that fear all the time. You have to consult with it before every decision you make. It's a really terrible place to be because you can never actually be your true self. How do you even know what you like? Because you're so fearful of what may happen if you made a certain decision. You can't, can't have a balanced equation ever. You're a slave to the fear. It's, it is miserable. And that's why, again, you walk uh, perfect love, cast out fear. When you're really feeling God's love, then there's no room. Just like we talked about in Ephesians last week, Jason, when uh, you came on the show after we learned from Pastor Anthony. It's like it filled you up. It, it surpassed. It fills out and pushes out all of the garbage. That's what God's love, the agape love that, that we discussed, that is God's love pushes out all the fear and that's how you're able to live your life. And it's hard to expect these secular people to have that type of courage. It really is. I don't know how they would. I, I want to circle back to you, TJ, and then I want Anthony to jump in just because this is specific to something I wrote in a column this week about Ben Shapiro and the overreaction to Kyrie Irving and just the, the censoring of, of, of thought. And, and that's what I think is going on with Kyrie. He's got some radical thoughts, ideas that we all seem to be, or the, not we all, but some people seem to be afraid of and they don't, let's don't platform him, let's, we gotta shut him down and anybody that says anything in agreement with him, we gotta shut it down. And so I wrote at the end of my column about Ben Shapiro over at the Daily Wire. Ben Shapiro is a very bright man. He has no reason to fear Kyrie, Kanye West, Max Blumenthal, or anyone who disagrees with him. Armed with the truth, he should engage with any critic and let his light push out darkness. That's been the history of America until those of us who believe in God and Judeo-Christian culture chose to deprioritize our faith to live more comfortably in a secular world. Our detachment from God has ratcheted our fear and caused us to be less tolerant of speech we find disagreeable and uncomfortable. The silenced, the demonized, and the unheard turn conspiratorial, unpredictable, and dangerous. The division destroying America can be directly traced to our lack of resolve to protect the free speech of our adversaries. And, and I just, free speech is rooted in religious faith. And that's what, when I see people with a lack of respect for the Constitution, Bill of Rights, the lack of understanding that these flawed men, and yes, they were slave owners and flawed men, they wrote a document that was inspired by their faith in God. And, mm -hmm. and the tenets and the, the things they put in there were consistent with a biblical worldview and free speech, that's the First Amendment, free, is at the root of that. And when I see people showing fear of free speech or, or you know, engaging with people that disagree with them is beneath them, I'm not even gonna engage. I see all that rooted in a lack of respect for free speech and fear. 
and and so that's why I, I'm excited, you know, and you make a great point. Anthony had made it, I think, off air as well. Like, hey, LeBron's team is is doing poorly and perhaps he needs Kyrie. And that's why now he's going to man up and defend Kyrie. And, and I hear that. I don't really care what's motivating him to do the right thing. I'm just excited that he's taken a step towards protecting Kyrie and Kyrie's religious freedom and free speech. Uh, and so if you could just react, the importance of free speech and, and how uh, a lack of religious faith makes people devalue free speech. Well, sure, and that's, that's the history of Marxism, right? That's, that's George Orwell, 1984, when you talk about Newspeak, if you guys, have, most people have read that book, um, there's a, a quote in there that says, don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak, Newspeak, by the way, if you haven't read the book, is their approved dictionary that they come out with every year. And there's new words and it's what you're allowed to say. And so um, as there's a new edition every year of new words that are gone, they don't add words, they only take words away. They said, don't you see the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it, right? And that's the idea. And because and, we've gone past free speech, we've moved into free thought and that you can't think that. It's a sin to even think that. And so Kyrie could come out and have an apology, but no, he still may think that. So he needs to demonstrate these five or six things before he comes back to show us that he doesn't even think that anymore. So we move far past that. It, the, the logical next step to, to uh, disallowing a free speech is disallowing a free thought. And so we're in dangerous territory. Um, Free speech is what allows us to sort through the bad ideas. It's the only way you can do it. And you have reasonable people on the side of truth who are clinging to the Bible and scripture. And that, by the way, scripture is what ended slavery. Scripture is what got us through all sorts of things. Uh, many of the injustices throughout history were ended because of how people looked at scripture. And so that it, it's just, you know, as it relates to Ben Shapiro, um, Ben, to me, this is strategy. I think he is, he thinks these people, he doesn't want to give them credibility or justify what they're saying by lending his credible name to it. And he takes this approach in foreign policy as well. I've seen him talk about it with North Korea. He was always upset that President Trump would meet with Kim Jong-un because he's saying you're giving him credibility and we shouldn't do that. He doesn't get a seat at the table. And so Ben would be saying here that Kyrie Irving shouldn't get a seat at the table, right? For guys who are going to have these kind of thoughts about Jewish people. And, I, and again, Kyrie hasn't been as expansive as, as Kanye West has. But the idea with this black Hebrew Israelite thing would be that, Ben, you're actually a, an imposter. You're a fraud and that black people are the real Jews. And Ben's saying, I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. And that's one way to go about it. But the issue you run into is as you pointed out just with steve kim not uh, just a few minutes ago it's like this stuff's been around it's not you ignoring it's not going to make it go away you've actually got to attack it with a better argument and that's the only way you can approach it and so i don't i don't appreciate ben's uh approach here i understand it's strategic and it actually it's working for him right now because people are so sensitive about any attacks on jewish people because of the holocaust understandably but I don't, I don't like the approach. You have to give a better argument and not just say you can't say that. There is no biblical place in terms of, um, as far as allowing someone to speak things uh, from a genuine perspective. Now, obviously there are people who are literally just trying to talk in terms of hate. But if a person is expressing themselves from a genuine position, then let's deal with the issue. Let's talk about it. Let, let's face it and see. Uh, on one occasion in, in the book of Acts, uh, the fact that the Christian movement, uh, at the time it was called the way, the Christian movement is, is, is growing, it's multiplying. Several people are, are moving. Uh, and the Sanhedrin, uh, they approached this Jewish scholar named Gamaliel. 
Uh, and they said, hey, we got to do something about this movement because, you know, these people are, are, are just, you know, multiplying. And Gamaliel says, you know, let them let them continue. He says, if this is not of God, then it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, then we can't do anything to stop it anyway. And so as it relates to, you know, Kyrie, you, you did it well when you first talked about it. Kyrie shares a link on social media. That's the extent of what he he shares a link. He did not express all of his comprehensive thoughts. Few people do on social media. He did not do a deep, intensive uh, study with somebody to say, hey, this is the whole thing that I believe. He shared a link. And from that link, everybody has assumed what he thinks, what he knows, how he feels. And then from that, we move to we don't even want you. Look, you may agree or disagree with what Kyrie says, but he has a right on his social media page to share a link. What about all the people who may believe the same thing that Kyrie does, but just don't share the link? Like we don't we don't know. But if we would embrace the conversation, have a discussion with Kyrie. Uh, one of the passages that I submitted, uh, I'll just read a portion of it is in Ephesians chapter four. And this relates to uh, how we need to share the discussion. Verse 15, I'll cut to the chase. Paul says, but speaking the truth in love. That phrase, speaking the truth in love, it, it carries with it the idea that we are in a, some kind of a relationship when we have this discussion. So often in the realm of social media, we do more talking at a situation versus into talking to a person. That takes maturity, that takes courage, that takes humility, willingness to learn. Kyrie may have a perspective on something on scripture that you have never embraced. Let me talk about it, let me look into it and see. And when I compare it to God's word, we will see because I am a firm believer that God's word is true. But if we say, hey, no, he can't even say these things, and as TJ is, is, is going through, when I saw the list of, of alleged demands that they have for him to come back, we are now to the point where we're saying not only can you not say this, which he didn't say, he just shared a link initially. We're saying, I don't even want you to think this. And your thought process must meet an approval of other hmm. people. That's a dangerous road that we, we share. So this idea about fear, another passage real quickly. Isaiah chapter one, verse 18, we use this as we talk about discussing things. Uh, the scripture says, come now, let us reason together. Let's sit down and talk about it. Isaiah chapter one, verse 18. Let's talk about this. Uh, I've had some Bible studies uh, with people who share some of the uh, belief systems that Kyrie does. We're able to look at scripture the thing that that I want to speak, which will continue to speak long after our discussion is our relationship and the interaction that we have. If my interaction just comes down to, well, you can't say that and you're not talking, we've lost any kind of momentum that we're going to have. But if we start from the basis of a relationship to say, OK, uh, let me hear what you got to say and, 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 I'll, and I'll comment and we'll look at this and we'll discuss we may leave possibly agreeing, we may leave disagreeing, but at least we've had the conversation. And that's one of the things uh, that I remember in one of our earlier shows that you were so uh, adamant about in spaces like Twitter and social media, a place where we can at least have the conversation. May not agree or disagree, but let's at least have the conversation. Mm -hmm. Anthony, I want to, and TJ, but Anthony, I, I want to share an email I got earlier this week or yeah, it was three days ago, earlier this week, uh, from a man that I believe is part of the Hebrew Israelite deal. Okay. And, and, and he starts out, I'm gonna skim through, but he starts out, thank you, sir, for being a smart black man in our community. I respect you and your Christian beliefs and I admire you for taking stands for what you believe is right. Then he pivots. However, it is painfully obvious that you don't know S-H-I-T, about why they are truly trying to ostracize Kyrie, even though you will not understand, absolutely cannot understand, and don't have a clue what is really going on, is simply because of the Christian faith you possess, 
which is the exact false doctrine, prophecy, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, at some point, he, he curses at me again. He wraps it up with, ask yourself this question, then, then why do Jewish people absolutely denounce any affiliation and connection to him? You are way past due on waking up, bro, and that's what will enable you to clearly understand that this entire situation is a spiritual battle, not anti-SHIT, but again, you are truly ignorant and safe. And mm. I'm leaving out some other stuff where sure. he attacked me. And, and so I, I sent him back. And, and to be honest, I've always known this, but I've really learned it from my relationship with you, TJ, Bobby, mm -hmm. Virgil, Delano. You guys have helped me. And it, it, it's this, the response I sent him back was, I appreciate your profane wisdom and intellect. <laughs> it's the profanity and condescension that makes me highly interested in your immense spiritual knowledge. I hope that one day I'm wise enough to reach your level of spiritual understanding because perhaps then I will send out profane, condescending emails to people I do not know. Oh and, and so I, I don't think it went over the guy's head. I haven't heard back from him. Yeah. But I, I'm basically saying, like, he's not going to catch anything with his approach and his condescending his and 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 his profanity and all that it's not a good representation so i'm when i'm reading his email i'm like oh this is what pe when people hear me curse that's what they think oh. about me and, and and it's like that's what and it's why again i'm attracted to your light tj's light uh virgil delano's and it's like these guys really are disciplined with their tongue and they hit people with a positive energy all the time because I can be condescending. So I, I see myself <laughs> in what this guy's doing yeah. and I see how unattractive it is. And there's a different way without the profanity, without the condescension. Well, the condescension is the same when you just say, we ain't even, you're beneath us. We're not addressing it. We're not doing, and, and it hits people the same way. Like, I don't want to be associated with that. Here's, here's the thing that I, I think about that, and, and I've told you about some of the different camps and how they approach this, and some may be very disrespectful, like that email you got, very belligerent. One of the questions that I ask, not just them, but, but any kind of religious organization uh, or faith tradition, faith group, if your faith leads you to hate people, to take vengeance on people, okay? I, I, I question its origin because God himself says, I am love. So, so does God hate sin? Yes, but he loves those who happen to commit sin. And he's trying to love you in spite of that, that you may repent of your sin, but I'm trying to get to you. And I, I share with you, I think once in our Bible studies, when Jesus walked this earth, everybody that he encounters, literally every person is filthy with sin. It is, I mean, and here's a person that's perfect, spotless, and you're walking through a mud and dusty field of sin. But he doesn't approach every citizen with this, oh, you disgust me with your, oh, look at you. He doesn't approach us with that email that you got, with profanity. And he could because he's perfect and we're not. But he meets us in grace. He meets us in mercy. Are there people that I sometimes encounter that have a belief system that is totally antithetical to what Scripture teaches? Yes. But my goal is not to better uh, you know, fight with them. No, the goal is I want to introduce you to Jesus because the same one that's able to help me in my mess, to help me in my sins, I am sure can help you in yours if you surrender to him. But, but some of these movements take their root in how do I justify some of the pain of the past? And, and if I want to scratch the itch of we got to get them back. If I want to scratch the itch of why would somebody do somebody like this? Oh, here's a response. And it soothes my anger and frustration. Then here's why I choose that. I, I'm not a part of that. I'm a part of a system that says we're going to love because God is love. And let's operate in that. I'm willing to have the discussion. 
But the discussion should lead us. Either we agree on this or we disagree on this, but we shouldn't leave hating one another. TJ, I'll let you hop back in. As it relates to your the the swear words and stuff, I, that's that was kind of my takeaway. Um, you've mentioned before Tony Dungy said something to you uh, about how yes. you speak. it's you know <clears throat> the um, it's it's so acceptable now even on television. It's like we've moved from only a few people say these things, and you got to watch certain channels to hear these words, to it's in everything. They're sneaking swear words into kids' shows now. And so it's actually just an opportunity for us to be different. You know, it's like, it's kind of weird when you have a full conversation and there's not one swear word from anyone because it's just normal discussion. Like you talk about so many people listen to hip-hop and rap now. It's, it's just how people talk in their everyday life. It's an opportunity for us to... Be a little bit different. My my um, my mom is perhaps the most naive person I've ever met, and I used to think that was a terrible thing. I'm like, man, she grew up on a farm. She's just always uh, always thought, how could people think that and do that? I promise you, I would I would bet my life on this. She's never said a swear word before. It's just it's just not in her. And so um, I, I used to think, you know. You're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. But it's like, come on, you, you got to still understand what's going on. And, and now I'm like, man, sh- like her naivety is such a light to everybody she comes across. They're like, what is so different about her? Why? She doesn't even think negative things like that. It's just it's not in her. So she has the opportunity now to explain to people why she's different. Because it's not just like, oh, I'm not going to say that word. It's like, no, she, her mind has been renewed. It is so different when you're having those conversations. So you picked up that email on the negative way, and there was never a chance after the, after the first paragraph that he had any chance of touching you. But you're going to get a lot of emails like that. If you got an email from my mother, you'd circle back at some point and be like, I need to engage with this person. What's so different about her? And so I'm just that the swear word thing is, is just a little microcosm of that. But it's just like we have the opportunity with how we conduct ourselves to reflect Jesus. And as we present that, we can do it without ever saying the words Jesus. It's just that guy's different. What's different about him? And then we get an opportunity to say, I'm trying really hard to be like this guy named Jesus. Guy, I, and, and guys, I know I've thrown a curveball by lacing our conversation with LeBron James and, and, and Kyrie Irving, but one, I know Anthony's a yeah. big sports fan and, and, and can handle it, but I, I, I do want to just kind of circle back to that because it's in the news and I think it's significant. And, and, and I want to know how I should feel because I do, my, my instincts are, I could care less what his motives are. He, he's finally doing what I wanted done from the beginning. We're going way too far with this Kyrie Irving thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, We need to be trying to uh, hit this man with uh, the truth in a very respectful way because, and I love TJ's point about what we were saying about, and Anthony, you're you're not, well, do you remember KRS One or the rap? Yeah, yeah. I mean, literally, I love TJ's point. It's like, hey, this stuff isn't going anywhere. It's been Mm -hmm. 1989 when that came out. And I was and 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 I was really into hip hop, and I was really into KRS One. The first time I ever heard "Why Is That," I can remember right now the moment I'm in my little hot 1985 Honda Prelude. <laughs> I'm hear that song, and I pulled over and I cried. It wow. hit me that way. Wow. I hadn't ever heard that like. It made me proud as a black man. I'm on a college campus or whatever, and and. It was just all part of my journey. Mm -hmm. Never made me question being a Christian, but it was all just part of my journey. And and we gotta let people have their journeys. And and if we keep hitting them with the truth, as my grandmother Mm -hmm. kept hitting me with the truth, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as life and as God introduced me to different people and, and opened my eyes to my flaws or whatever, his truth is winning out. Yes. And <laughs> it always will. And, and, and so I, I'm going to have faith and trust that if, if we give Kanye truth and not try to shut him down or Kyrie, Kanye, whomever, not try to shut him down. If we just hit him with truth, 
eventually the truth's going to win. I feel very confident in that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the passages that came to mind with this, Paul says in Colossians 4, he says, let your conversation be with grace and let your words be seasoned with salt. As TJ is referencing this, and even as we look at what you know, LeBron James says, what that passage means is it doesn't mean that we say everything that comes to mind, but we mind everything we come to say. Let me think about what I'm about to say, the impact, how this is going to move. I think with a lot of time, big media, big celebrities, they have such media teams and stuff. LeBron's initial statement, you got to say something, LeBron. You're the face of the NBA. You're an athlete billionaire. You know, you got you to gotta say something about what Kyrie's saying in this hate speech and all of this. And then now, you know, he's injured. And I don't want to put too much in it, but he just got injured. The team is kind of in a slump. They, he and Kyrie have this on again, off again kind of deal. They've had it through their career, you know, Kyrie doesn't like him one point. I got to get rid of, you know, away from LeBron. Now I got to get back with him. And now there was all this summer, this trade rumor of, okay, they're about to get it and they don't. And now here we are when they mm. put this extension out, not when everybody's canceling Kyrie for posting a link, but after they put these demands, I was, okay, wait a minute. Now that's too much. Good statement, LeBron. I agree with that. <laughs> I just think even way back then it was, I may disagree with what Kyrie says, but I don't think he needs to be canceled for all of this. He's, he's I, you know, I've played with him. He's got to go. Here's where I'm going to give not an excuse to LeBron, but just context. I don't think LeBron is standing on much truth, biblical okay. truth. And so that's, and again, when you're not standing on biblical truth, it promotes fear. Sure. The reason mm. why, the reason why my instincts immediately were, we got to defend Kyrie is because I'm standing on the greatest truth that's ever told. Yeah. Yeah. LeBron's not standing on that, so it's going to take him a week or two, or situations, or losing streaks, <laughs> to to move him to where oh now I can see the truth. And that mm. again is where I, I just go back to. These people in a country that's not standing on truth, a country that is sitting around debating whether men can have babies. We standing on some of the biggest lies in the world. No wonder we're cowards. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder we're cowards. We're not standing on truth. Yeah. That, yeah. that, that, that that's. TJ, I'm going to give you the final word. And yeah, um, Pastor Anthony, we'll I just want to add one here. thing into the. One thing into the record, um, the Lakers are not in a slump. They're terrible. They suck. They're horrible. They need <laughs> They're Kyrie. in a slump, TJ. <laughs> really, really bad. There's, there's no nothing <laughs> slumping about this. One other thing, this, uh, it, the, the story doesn't fit exactly, but it, it'll be kind of a metaphor for what I'm talking about. Standing on truth. Um, the, the, in 2 Kings 6, the prophet Elisha was, um, he was Israel was at war with Syria. And Elisha was telling the king of Israel all the strategic things. Elisha, a prophet hearing from God, was telling the king of Israel all the strategic places that the Syrians were coming to attack them. So they were always gone. So a Syrian king came in and said to his own people, hey, who, who is, we got a mole. We, we got a rat. Somebody in here is telling on us because every time we think we got them, they slip away. And so there, there are guys say, nah, man, there's, there's a guy named Elisha and, uh, he's the one he's hearing from God and he's telling them all of our plans. And so, um, Elisha wakes up one day his, his servant wakes him up and he is fully surrounded by the Syrian army. And it's just those two. And so the servant's freaking out and he's saying, we're about to die. What are we going to do? And he says, Elisha says, do not be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And the servant's like, oh, what are you talking about? I don't see any. He's looking all throughout the mountains. I don't see anybody with us. Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. And he opened his eyes and he looked in the hills and saw uh, hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. It was God's army surrounding them. And so at that point, Elisha said, God strike them with blindness. The entire Syrian army went blind immediately. And he was able to lead them back to the king of Israel as they were captured at that point. Took nothing. It was 
God taking care of him with his army. And so that is the way it is to me when we're standing on truth. It feels like we're all alone and it's just us sitting here, but it's God's truth that you're standing on. There are chariots of fire everywhere and the truth is going to win out. It may take a while, you may get thrown in jail, they may kill you over it, but the truth is going to win out. And we, as we continue to try to speak this truth, there are chariots of fire surrounding us, protecting us as we go about this. May not, who knows, we may be hung upside down on a cross at some point ourselves, but eternally in heaven, we will be there and the truth is going to win out when it's all said and done. That's a good note to end on. Uh, let's play some harmony and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. So divided, stop fighting and stand tall. We used to be a nation, one united. Now we're headed for a downfall. God let your light shine down. What we need more than anything now. Harmony. Let's make a simple vow. Let's come together now. Harmony. Put all your weapons down. Tell us, cause together we're so much stronger. God, let your light shine down. What we need more than anything now. Harmony. Let's make a simple vow. Let's come together now. Harmony. Put all your weapons down. Love one another now. Get to me Open up your eyes and see